But God is going to establish this covenant with a people he knows won't keep it. That's an enigma. Something puzzling about that. Why would God do that? Why would he enter into and establish a covenant when he knows it won't be kept? Think about a a young man that asked his beloved to marry him. Oh, would you please marry me down on one knee? Diamond ring and everything. And she responds by saying, yes, she's so excited. Yes, I will for a while. (laughs) Does he take that as good news? Oh, yes, I would love to, until I don't. No. God enters into covenant. He established a covenant with one he knows won't keep it. That's the enigma. Well, let's let's talk more about it here. First of all, a covenant. Let's talk about what a covenant is. A covenant is a contract that forms a relationship. A covenant is a contract that forms a relationship. A covenant is something more than a contract. It's a contract that forms a relationship. So the idea of this contract being something that is either based on or that forms a relationship is very uh, very important in the understanding of what a covenant is. Let's say you you hire somebody to come build an addition onto your house. And uh, they, the, the, you sign a contract with me, you have an agreement, right? A contract is an agreement between two parties. And so the contractor does his part, builds the addition. You do your part, pay them the money that's owed for the building of the addition. That's a, that's a contract. You don't expect the carpenter to move into your house. This contract does not establish a relationship. A covenant is something more than just a contract. A covenant is something that is based on and that establishes a relationship. That's why we talk about a marriage covenant and not just a marriage contract. Because there is an agreement between two parties, a man and a woman in marriage, but it's more than just an agreement in 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 a contract. It is based on and forms a relationship, a marriage relationship of husband and wife. That's what a covenant is. So, listen to the relational nature of God's covenant with Israel. Again, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Later in Leviticus 26, something similar is going to be said. You can hear in this the relational nature of God's covenant with Israel. When God says in Leviticus 26, I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. So as God is establishing this covenant, we call it often the Mosaic Covenant with his people, the people are happy to enter into the covenant with the Lord. Again, back in chapter 19 of Exodus, look at verse 8. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Of course we will obey the Lord. And I like how it, how it says it there. All that he says, we will do. And so then Moses takes this answer, or this people's response to God establishing a covenant with them, to God, and he says to to the Lord, your people are in on this. Your people are on team Yahweh, because they are ready to do everything that you command them to do. God's response is very interesting and very telling because if it were me, I'm thinking I would receive that as good news. I'm establishing a covenant with you and you respond positively to that covenant and you say, yes, I will do everything that you have asked me to do in this agreement, this covenant. And yet you'll notice that that God doesn't respond to the people doesn't say anything to them about 
their response to the covenant. It's very interesting and very telling to us what God does. Instead of saying, great, you're on my team. Great, we're in covenant together now. God begins to reveal to them a awesome and terrible display of his holiness. 